chapter 19, we started out in the last message talking about coming to Jesus like a child. Not childishly, but childlike faith, we come to Jesus in the simplicity of a child with the faith that we do have. We also discussed about a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and in his wealth and in his leadership role and youth, he came to Jesus asking questions about how he could have eternal life. These penetrating questions are questions that we hear to this day from people that we talk to about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because so many have the idea, even in this day of ours, that somehow you've got to work your way into heaven. Somehow you've got to do the right thing. Somehow you've got to work hard enough or try to achieve or try to be good enough in order to earn salvation. That was the problem this young man had. And he came to Jesus asking questions. Asking questions about what must I do to achieve salvation and have eternal life. He asked him which commandments should I keep and uh, what is lacking in my life. And as the young man came to Jesus, Jesus absolutely broke down the barrier that when we hold on to things and we allow things to become an obstacle to our relationship with him, we'll never know what it is to have eternal life. And when you put things ahead of Christ, you'll never know what it is to have eternal life. As long as you rely on your works or rely on your efforts to earn salvation, you will never know eternal life. Jesus has taught us that it is only through him that we can know eternal life. That's where we're at at this point. And the sad picture as we left the previous message was that the young man turned around and he walked away because he was unwilling to let go of his money. He was unwilling to let go of the things that he possessed. He was unwilling to give his all to Jesus Christ. And so it was a sad picture as he walked away. I mentioned in the early service, I don't think I mentioned it in the second service, that I have seen folks here in our own church, some who have come down this aisle with tears in their eyes. Even last uh, week we saw people coming with tears in their eyes to give their lives to Jesus. And what a blessing that is to our church when people come to Jesus. But I must say on a sad note that I've also watched people that I knew did not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, who came to our church and they heard about Jesus and they walked around and they walked out that door without knowing Jesus as their Savior. A few that we've not seen since. And how sad it is to see someone turn and walk away from Jesus. Jesus because they're unwilling to commit their life to him. So we come to verse 23 at this point. After the young man walked away, the Bible says that Jesus turned to his disciples who were with him, and Jesus said this, truly I say to you, only with difficulty, it is very difficult, will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. It is so difficult that Jesus gives to us an illustration. And the illustration is, in verse 24, again I tell you that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now Bible scholars will argue and debate over what exactly this needle is that Jesus refers to, a camel going through. Some will argue that it's actually a sewing needle and the hole is so small it would be impossible for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. There's others who argue that there was a little gate around Jerusalem that was used as a small passage that only a small person could get through to get through the gate and it would be impossible for a camel to pass through that gate. The the point that Jesus is making is not a matter of us arguing or debating over whether or not he's talking about an eye of an actual needle or the gate entrance. The point that Jesus is making is that it is impossible for someone who is unwilling to commit their life to him to be saved. If you're not willing to commit your life to Jesus Christ, it is impossible for you to have eternal life. The young man that we've been discussing 
was unwilling to let go of the things that he had. And for us, <coughs> coming to Christ, we find it very difficult to give up those things that we treasure. Those things that are absolutely most important to us. We find it hard to say, I'm going to turn. And remember that repentance is not just a matter of turning. You, we've defined the word repentance as an about face, a military term that's an about face. And it's not just a matter of turning around. If you're just turning around, uh, all you're doing is reforming yourself. So repentance is more than that. Repentance is more than just giving up smoking or giving up cussing or giving up drinking or drugs. It's more than giving something up. You do that, that's just reform. Repentance means that you turn from something to something. And so true repentance is more than just reforming your life. It's more than just giving something up. True repentance means that I turn from my sin, I do an about face, and I turn to Jesus. And the problem that many people who have things have is that to make that commitment to Jesus Christ means that I commit everything that I am, everything that I have, I commit it to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that wealthy people have a hard time doing that. He didn't say that no wealthy people will ever be saved. He didn't say that. He didn't say that, that they couldn't be wealthy and be a child of God. He didn't say that. But what he's teaching us is that someone who is unwilling to repent, someone who is unwilling to turn from their sins and turn to him with a commitment of their life to Christ will never know eternal life. Because it is not reform, it is repentance to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus reminds us of how difficult it is many times for people to give up what is most treasured in their life in order to follow Jesus. Now, let's look at verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. And they said, who then can be saved? So they've seen this guy come to Jesus. And the guy that came to Jesus, remember we learned by reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the descriptions given in the Gospels about this fellow. And he's described as being rich. He's described as being a ruler, most people believe, of the synagogue. Uh, and, and he was young. And so he comes to Jesus. He's wealthy. He's a leader. He's young. Everything that the world calls success as a matter of fact, remember what we said in the last message, Jewish thought was the more wealth you have, the more God is blessing you. As a matter of fact, in ancient times, one of the ways that people showed their power and authority was by how many wives they had, how much they owned, how many cattle they owned, how many horses they had, how much possessions that they had. And so Jews grew up hearing that having a lot of things meant the blessings of God upon your life. And so now these disciples are seeing a guy that's got it all. He's young, he's rich, and he's a leader. Doesn't that mean that the blessings of God are upon his life? And Jesus breaks that down. That's not what brings about eternal life. Jesus is teaching us that having things is not what earns salvation. It is a personal relationship with him. So the disciples in verse 25, they're hearing Jesus talk to this rich young ruler. And they start asking then, well, who then can be saved? If, if being good and following the laws and doing things doesn't save you, how in the world can you be saved? If wealth is not a mark of the blessings of God, then how in the world can someone be saved? And so Jesus is going to give to us a profound answer because quite often what we have been taught in the past becomes dangerous to our future. And I hear people sometimes telling me when I talk to them about salvation, you have never heard such in your life. There are times where I, I just pull my hair out. That's why it's like it is now. Some of the things that people tell me about how they believe someone is saved, it's unbelievable. And sometimes I'll even look at them and I'll be like, where did you get that? Where did you hear such as that? That's not what the Bible says. So remember that sometimes what we've been taught in the past can be dangerous for our future. 
And that was true of these folks. Thinking that wealth gets you into heaven, thinking that being good and doing good gets you in heaven, is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And so, if these things don't do it, the disciples said, how in the world can somebody be saved? Jesus said, with man this is impossible. Because remember that the way to eternal life and going to heaven is not being 51% perfect, it's not being 80% good or perfect, it's not being 90% perfect or 99% perfect, it's being 100% perfect. How in the world can I be saved? If I can't make myself perfect, if I can't make myself who I ought to be to enter into the presence of a holy, righteous God, how in the world can I be saved? If I can't work, if I can't be good enough, I can't attend church enough, I can't give enough money, I can't work hard enough, I can't achieve it, I can't earn it, how in the world can anybody be saved? Jesus said, with man, you're right, it is absolutely impossible. It's impossible. You cannot save yourself. Because no matter how good you try to be, no matter how hard you try to work, no matter how much you give, no matter how hard you work, no, no matter how nice you are to other people, no matter what you have, remember this, you've still got a problem. You still have a sin nature that's never been taken care of. It is impossible to save yourself. You just can't do it. And so the disciples were like, who in the world can be saved then? And Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so it's impossible for me to save myself. I can't do it. But with God, all things are possible. God is the one that brings salvation to our life. God is the one that makes us who we ought to be. And we discover as we read the whole of the Bible that we've sinned against God. We discover in the Bible that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23 that we quote quite often, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, most of the time when you read that verse, verse and you read, For all have sinned, you think, Okay, that means we sinned in the past. But when you look at the grammar of that verse, that word is in grammatically what is called the present tense, which means you keep on sinning. And so when Paul said that, he said, not only have we sinned in the past, but we keep on sinning. We have all sinned. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of that is death. The wages of sin and sinning is death. You see the impossibility? How in the world can I save myself? It's impossible for me to save myself. But Romans 6.23 goes on to say, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, But God has shown his love to us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What is impossible with men is possible with God. And Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's impossible with man is possible with God. And Jesus describes this to us. Not only does he save us by his works and his death, burial, and resurrection, but he goes so far as the Bible says that he gives to us his righteousness. The big word for that, in, in academic circles, it's called the imputed righteousness of God. What happens is, is that when I give my life to Jesus Christ, He comes to indwell in my life, and He places in me His own righteousness. That's how I can stand before a holy God as though I never sinned. When I stand before God, I don't stand before God 51% perfect. When I stand before God, I don't stand before God 80% perfect. Not based on what I did. I'm 100% perfect in the eyes of God. Because he does not see my works. What God sees in me is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He has given in me what I could never achieve. That's what Jesus has done for me. That is salvation in Jesus Christ. What is impossible with man 
is possible with God. His death, burial, and resurrection was impossible for me to accomplish because I have sin. And no one else could do it for me because the Bible says we have all sinned against God. Only God himself could take upon himself human flesh and live a life of perfection to be the perfect sacrifice for my sins. And he did that. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And so Jesus is teaching us about how salvation works in our life. Uh, here comes the typical Simon Peter at this point. Simon Peter comes back to him. And remember our impossibilities are God's possibilities. And one of the reasons I like Peter is he reminds me of myself. He's always saying things. Sometimes he regrets saying later. But in verse 27, the Bible said that Peter said in reply to Jesus, when Jesus was teaching about this, Peter said, Jesus, or see, we have left everything and followed you. What will we have? What then will we have? It's kind of like what's in it for us. <laughs> and... Um, so Jesus answered him, not in a smart aleck way, but Jesus taught him a valuable lesson that all of us need to learn. Because when we come to Jesus, remember that we give him everything that we have and everything that we are. And we place it in the hands of Jesus. You've heard me preach on numerous occasions that we forfeit the rights to our own life. We forfeit who we are. We forfeit our future. We forfeit our decisions. We forfeit any rights that we have may have held on to in the past. And we give it to Jesus. And we say, Jesus, whoever you want me to be, I pray by your Spirit you'll make me who you want me to be. Jesus, I forfeit to you the right. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever that means in my life, I will follow. So with that in mind, when we came to Jesus, we did that. We said, Jesus, we give you our life. We're willing to suffer. We're willing to die. We're willing to be persecuted. We're willing to go wherever you want us to go. Lead us wherever you would take us, and we will follow. So Peter says, what happens then? What difference does it make, and what, are, what happens to us once we do that? And Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, Will also sit, you will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. Now, most of us in this church do not totally understand that, but especially people around the world understand what Jesus was saying. Because in our country, sometimes people don't like it when we get saved. And I would dare say probably some of you did lose some friends, maybe. And I, I do know some folks that come to our church that did lose friends when they gave their life to Jesus. They did lose folks that didn't want to be around them anymore because their life was changed. Not that they snubbed them. But the friends just didn't want to be around them anymore because now they had faith in Jesus Christ. I've had church members through the years that lost their jobs because of their faith, ran off from where they work, friends snubbed them. I've had church members in some cases where their families did not want them around anymore. We had a young man saved here at our church, and his dad did not want him to come, and his dad did not want him to follow through on his decision to be saved. So sometimes there are family members that will turn their backs on us when we walk with Jesus. There are times where, where the world may seem to turn against us. But Jesus said, let me tell you something. When you follow me and someone leaves you, you, you had to give up your house or you, you lost your job, or you were persecuted, or your brothers turned against you, or your sisters turned against you, or a father or a mother turned against you, or even your children, or you even lost things that you owned. If you did that, and that happened to you because you followed me, don't think you're being cheated for following Jesus. Don't ever have the idea that you're getting shortchanged. Don't ever get it in your head why did I do this? I mean, how many times have I heard through the years 
that when somebody gave their life to Jesus and people started turning against them, I've had young believers, and, and this is not to scold them, because remember, they're babes in Christ, and they still are learning. But sometimes it's like, man, ever since I gave my life to Jesus, I'm being attacked, and I'm losing friends, and, and in my business, I'm losing people coming to my business, and it's been since I came to Jesus. And it's real easy for you, if you're not careful, to think that somehow you were shortchanged by giving your life to Jesus. After all, now the world hates me. I've got an enemy. Satan is attacking me. Satan is, is coming against me. And, and I've got enemies. And the world hates us. And the world wants to kill us. And, and these Muslims, they're trying to kill believers all over the world. And, and we were discussing in Sunday school this morning about the horrific news of some believers just being rolled over in one of those, like you used to uh, press out blacktop, a roller, and they were running over these Christians just because they're Christians. And we hear about the persecution of God's people around the world. And one of the thoughts could easily come into your mind, am I being shortchanged because I'm following Jesus? I look at my friends and they're out partying and it looks like they're having so much fun. They seem to be running and doing things and going places and, and laughing and joking and having so much fun. And I don't do that. Am I being shortchanged by following Jesus? Listen closely again to what Jesus says. Everyone who has left houses or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, you could add into it anything that has happened in your life that is no longer in your life once you've given your life to Jesus. That it couldn't be in your life because of your commitment to Christ. Because you came to Christ in a full, total commitment of your life, these things can't be a part of it anymore. And so what Jesus is saying, that anything that can no longer be a part of your life because of your commitment to me, understand this. When that happens for Jesus, you will receive 100-fold. It is 100 times better to follow Jesus than to have those things that really didn't need to be in your life anyway. Anything that was an obstacle to you following Jesus didn't need to be there anyway. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that this world has to offer that is worth you missing out on Jesus. There is nothing at work worth you losing Jesus over. There is nothing at home. There is nothing in town. There's nothing on TV. There's no ball game. There is no wealth. There is no position in my job that is worth missing out on Jesus. And Jesus said that when you follow me and these things are not following you, don't worry about it. What you receive in Jesus is a hundred times better than all of these things. Amen. And beyond that, listen to what he says. You're going to receive an eternal life. Notice that he uses the word inherit. The Bible does not say you've bought eternal life. The Bible does not say you earned eternal life. The Bible does not say you achieved eternal life. The Bible says you inherited it. You didn't buy it. You didn't earn it. You didn't achieve it. You inherited it. Jesus gives to you out of the fountain of his never-ending love and grace and mercy. And all that you might have lost to follow him, you've gained better a hundred times over. And not only that, he gives to you eternal life. You live forever in his presence. What greater joy is there than walking in the very presence of Jesus? From time to time, I like to go to the book of Revelation and just read the descriptors there about heaven and worship in heaven and the scene of heaven and the beauty of heaven. But the reality is, even though all of those things are true, and all of these beautiful diamonds and emeralds and all of these different stones that are mentioned, and all the beautiful descriptors, and the street of gold, and mansion, and, and all of this stuff you read about, that's there. It's beautiful. But the greatest thing about heaven is that I will forever be in the very presence of a holy, righteous God. And when he looks at me, he sees me, not 51% holy, 
Not 80%, not 90%, not 99%. God looks at me as though I never sinned. And it's all because of the grace of Jesus. Nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. What a Savior we have. Jesus ended this chapter by saying, Many who are first will be last and the last first. There are those who will refuse Jesus. They have a lot of things. But it's a matter of those of us who know him that receive the reward of the blessing of being his followers. God has placed something within the human heart. There's something inside of us that God placed inside of us that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. Many of you will remember, perhaps back in the day before you knew Jesus as your Savior, that there was something inside of you. You couldn't explain it. You didn't know what it was. You just knew that there was a drawing that you didn't have. There was something missing in your life. And what happens is, is God has placed in all of us this area of life that it can only be filled by Him. Now here's the problem. If you do not trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, your heart is going to start wandering. Because only Jesus can fill that hole. And I've heard people who got saved describe to me, uh, I hear it a lot. People will say, I just felt like I had a hole in my heart. I just felt like there was a big hole in me. There was something missing in my life. Now listen, God placed that inside of you and it can only be filled by Jesus Christ. And if you don't trust him to fill that hole in your life, your heart will start wandering. And you're going to try to fill it with experiences. You're going to try to run to this bar and that lounge. And you're going to try to run from this relationship to that relationship. And you're jumping around in life going to all of these different things trying to find what it is that's going to fill that hole in your life. And all along, he's standing right here in front of you. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can fill that hole in your heart. But you've got to choose to receive what he did for you by dying on a cross, resurrecting from the grave. And he says, I tell you what, if you will give me your whole life, everything that you are, everything that you have, and you will come to me, and you'll lay your, feet, your, your life down at my feet, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you all of me. And while you're on the earth, I'm going to live inside of you. And everything that you go through, everywhere you go, everything that's done in life, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to give you everything you need to deal with it. And not only am I going to do that, I tell you what I'm going to do. Because the only way you can be in God's presence is to be 100% holy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my holiness so that you can be in God's very presence. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see what you did in your yesterdays. What he sees is perfection. Wow. Jesus said, if that's not enough, here's what else I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you eternal life. That for all eternity, you'll never experience death. Oh, this body may die, but you, who you are, this soul of yours that you really are, lives forever forever in the very presence of a holy God. Now, I want to ask you this. What's worth missing out on that? What is there that's worth more than that? What does this world have to offer you that's greater than what Jesus offers you? There's nothing. You could take this whole world, everything in it, you could make me the king of planet earth and I owned everything on this planet and it wouldn't be worth missing out on Jesus. My friends, Jesus fills the hole in your heart and he gives to you a hundred times better than anything you could ever find anywhere else. That's the way he loves you. It's not ha have anything to do with you. It's not have does not have anything to do with your goodness. It has nothing to do with your works. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you being worthy of that. None of us are. He doesn't do it because we're worthy. He does it because he is a grace-giving, mercy-showing, overflowing with love, generous, giving Savior who wants you to know the blessing of eternal life.
What a Savior. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, it's beyond our imagination to know how you love us. Wow. And Father, it's so easy when we know you to see. Father, there's, there's absolutely nothing that can compare to your presence in our life. And all that you give to us is far greater than anything this world has to offer. I'm in awe of you, Father. And I pray that daily I would grow in more awe of you. You're so wonderful. But Father, this world that we live in, much like this young man we've seen in chapter 19, they just don't want to let go of this stuff. They just don't want to let go because they think that that's what brings happiness. And, and yet they still lack. There's still a hole in their heart. Because the only way that hole can be filled is by Jesus and when we don't turn to you, we wander and our heart wanders and, and, and we seek to find the feeling for that hole and we don't find it and we don't find fulfillment. Father, I pray that folks listening to this message right now would just come to understand, you know, there's nothing in this world or in this life that can compare to the glory of walking with Jesus he saves me. He forgives me. He watches me. He gives me his righteousness. He makes me a child of God, worthy to stand in the very presence of the creator of the universe, the very presence of holy God, because of the righteousness of Jesus. And to top it off, he's given me eternal life. And Jesus, help us to see the value and that it's more valuable to follow Jesus than anything else that exists. Let us make that decision right now, wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen.